sir can you switch off your fan okay okay sir i have just reduced its speed hello yes yes sir ha i i hope this is okay yes yes sir absolutely okay start after 3 minutes sir okay sir no problem Shall we start, sir? Sure, sir. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I heartily welcome all of you in the Language Online Lecture Series Day Ten. At the outset, we, the team of Language, need to thank all the participants who have joined with us by logging Zoom app regularly, and those who are watching, enjoying, and learning with us live on Facebook and YouTube channel Language Educators. Thank you very much for your love, words of appreciations. blessings and academic support we have been receiving overwhelming response from all over india and abroad as well nationally and internationally acclaimed academicians are going to deliver their talks on various topics various aspects of a language and literature on the forthcoming days in addition to that is not the end of lecture series it's just a new beginning we will arrange such a lecture series every now and then we will try our best to 
invite well known academicians during this lockdown period we are giving there are certain instructions for the participants we are giving unique unique certificate to each and every participant but participant need to fill the google form and send their zoom participation screenshot or youtube channel langlis educators screenshot where you have watched all these videos as a kind of proof to to the email id elanglit motivators at the rate gmail dot com. Our designer is working on 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 the uh, the certificate. Very soon you will receive the Google form link. We are not generating certificates by Google forms. We are working on the certificates manually. It take that's why it take times. Uh, and you need to approach me through mail or my mobile number is there after seventh uh, of May. you can also visit the website uh, link www.langlit.org kindly keep in touch don't forget to subscribe the channel so that you will get the further notification of the well known academicians who are going to share his opinions friends today we have with us a well known nationally acclaimed academicians a scholar in fact a singer and a poet dr vaibhav sabnis has been serving in department of english at dr baba saheb ambedkar memorial college of law dhule since 1999 he has successfully worked as the coordinator of nac and iqsc his area of specialization are elt indian writing in english and legal language he is the founder president of iltai khandesh chapter he is the research guide of kbc north maharashtra university jalgaon uh, seven research scholars including a foreigner have successfully uh, uh, completed phd under his guidance he has delivered lecture and speeches as uh, as the keynote speaker resource person chief guest at various national and international seminars and conferences he has published books as an editor indian literature in english some reflections elt innovative methods and techniques and uh, there is one book in marathi manus mati ani nati uh, without further delay may i invite dr vaibho sabnis sir to deliver his talk on legal language as english for specific purposes thank you over to you sir thank you dr prashan mote sir good morning all the participants thank you very much for the very generous introduction uh, some things are more than what i deserve probably yeah. and this is a platform which uh, dr prashant sir has availed for us to interact with one another i congratulate dr prashant monte for this wonderful very wonderful work thank you sir. at a very young age he has achieved so many things and uh, miles to go dr prashant there is a very bright and glorious future waiting for you and during this lockdown i hope you are all very safe and fine and when we are locked down dr prashant has provided us very beautiful keys to unlock ourselves with different approach avenues so congratulations to dr prashant his efforts commendable and the langlit is working very nicely dear friends the topic that i have today is uh, legal language as english for specific purposes shockingly when everybody is related to law the law is the part and parcel of our life whatever we do in our life is legal has to be legal and when we cross the lakshman rekha the boundary then we fall in the trap of law and uh, the hands of law are very very long in this context whether this legal language that has been used is uh, comprehensible is it understandable is it uh, good for the lay persons can the lay persons accept to it access to it can they understand it these are some of the questions that come to our mind now i chose this topic because i have been serving in a law college for 20 years and i saw that the language of law is completely different though it is english it is a different kind of english and hence i thought that how how would it be if we study legal language as english for specific purposes many foreign countries have been working on this and they are prescribing this kind of english that is english for specific purposes or legal language in their curriculum however except few names like bhatia in india 
a very little, very scanty work has been done on legal language. So through this interaction, I hope that you'll also undertake some research on legal language. Though I'm basically con going to concentrate on legal language, let me tell you that there are some more important and interesting things with connected with or related with legal language. And that is law in literature, law in language, language in law and literature in law. So very, very beautiful, very interesting kind of things are there. And when we are talking about innovative research, I think this area is very, very interesting. But uh, let me just uh, stick to my topic that is legal language as English for specific purposes. So uh, le le uh, I'll, I'll uh, share my screen and uh, we'll discuss more about all these things. So dear friends, when uh, we are talking about legal language, let me tell you that there is nothing like uh, illegal language. Legal language and uh, illegal language has nothing to do when we are talking about legal language, we are talking about the language of law. Some people term it as the legalese, like we call the language of journalism, the language of uh, newspapers, etc. Journalese, so is the legalese. But again, some experts have criticized it because uh, legal language again has two aspects. One is that it's very, very difficult, very different, and only the legal experts, the lawyers, etc., can understand it. And then that's why when we talk about the difficulty level, the complexity and intricacy of this language, people have said that legalese is rather uh, a, a negative term. And that's why it is better to call it a legal language. The second thing that comes in our mind is, is legal language a language? Then again, some experts have said, some scholars have said that legal language is not a language, but a sub-language. So uh, keeping aside all these things, let us concentrate on the legal language. Now it has been uh, assumed, it has been a hypothesis that legal language means we are talking about basically English. However, legal language in different contexts, different cultures and different countries, communities can be any language as such. For example, when we talk about our um, Marathi courts, because the language of court in Maharashtra has to be Marathi basically. So that Marathi language is also a legal language. So let me clear, let me clarify in the beginning at the outset itself that when we are talking about legal language, we are talking about the international legal language. So the language of law is English. We know the importance of English because of technology, because of globalization, because of trade and commerce, and uh, because of free trade and all that. We find that the world has become a global village and we are imagining how the world would be from local to global. So we are local in many ways. In this context, we find that um, there are cases and uh, there are instances where uh, a law is enforced uh, and we need to understand what is legal language. So when we perceive legal language or when we approach legal language as English for specific purposes, so it is an English for specific purposes. It is the specific purpose in the legal context. So as I said earlier that everybody is associated with law. It is said in Marathi and many other languages that a wise person should never step in the court or a uh, hospital. We should not enter this. But for this reason or that reason, in our lifetime, we have to. And when we have to do this, when we have to awaken the people, enlighten the people, it is necessary for us to understand the basic laws. Because every time it is not good to go to a lawyer or uh, expert to interpret interpretation of laws. So if we understand legal language as English for specific purposes, in English for specific purposes, if we try to understand the complexities, the intricacies, the characteristics, the salient features of legal language, then definitely we can understand the laws. And it is said in English that ignorance of law is not in and uh, not an excuse. I'm repeating, ignorance of law is not an excuse. However, we literature people we say that ignorance is a bliss. So as far as law is concerned, it cannot be an excuse. So you cannot claim, you cannot ex give an excuse that you don't know the law and that's why you have broken it. So you came to know that it is broken after somebody has punished you or accused you, etc., etc. So in this context, uh, we being the laypersons, because we are not legal experts, it is our duty to understand the salient features, the traits of legal language. 
So uh, before talking about legal, legal language, let's talk about ESP, that is English for specific purposes. We find that English is everywhere. It is in uh, medicine, it is in engineering, it is in pharmacy, it is in law, it is in commerce, it is everywhere. So we find that there are different kinds of Englishes here and there. So the, the English spoken by two doctors on a particular disease, on a particular illness, or operation of a patient, or now the COVID-19, for example. So that English is completely different from the English that we use every day. So how everyday English, the general English, is different from the legal language, that is legal English. That is our topic. So we find that English is used differently in different situations by different people for different intentions and purposes. So when the same doctor talks with his or uh, his wife or children, then he uses general English. But when the same doctor is talking about a particular disease, then he or she is using that English for specific purposes, that is English for medicine. The same thing happens about hotel management, about pharmaceutical companies, the, um, uh, the medical representatives presenting themselves before the doctor and using those jargons. We as patients, we hardly understand that. And then we find that in international business and hotel management, at call center in banks everywhere there is english and that english is different so we have ecm we can you can uh, see my screen uh, it is english uh, in commerce and management then it is technology for academic purposes is another variety of english that we find and then english for social studies the list can be a very long list actually very long list because English in different situations, in different contexts, is completely different. Now, it differs in many ways, at many levels. For example, there is a variation, I'm saying variation or difference, uh, in terms of the lexicon, in terms of the style or syntax or semantics. And that's why we need to understand the peculiarities of uh, legal language as English for specific purposes. So here, when we are talking about specific purpose, then what is the purpose of the patient behind understanding that medical English? What is the purpose of the lawyer behind using that legal language in the court or with the client or with the colleagues? So that is a different communicative purpose which has aros arisen from the specific need. And that's why it is basically a professional kind of use. So the main purpose of uh, ESP that we see is trying to give justice to the needs and expectations of the users or those uh, people who are involved in that. For example, legal language. When we talk about legal language, we as clients, we as the accused, etc., etc., or the respondent or the complainant, etc., we need to understand the judgments or the pit writ petitions submitted by the lawyers. Or there, are, there are different forms and so many things. See, our whole life is surrounded by law. Even when we are talking about, on talking via Zoom, nowadays there is uh, lots of awakening regarding Zoom that it's dynamic and hacking and secrets are this and that and government has uh, uh, circulated an advisory regarding that. So again, law is there. So terms and conditions are there. But even we people who are educated people, we also, what we do is simply we say conditions, yes, I agree for the, with the terms and conditions, etc., etc., without reading, because it's a very long text and it is little difficult, it is not interesting, and we, the people of literature and language, are least interested, least bothered about that. So, what my point is that we choose the, those terms, particular form, apply for something, or bank loan, etc., etc or say LIC policy also, we blindly sign the document without reading anything. The agent also tells us, has those uh, uh, stars there and we sign there blindly and all the details are filled by that agent or the respective bank or company, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, means we do it blindly. So what we need is, we need to understand this. So this is ESP, that is English for specific purposes. It is based on the needs, the wants, the requirements, the purpose, the specific, specificity, et cetera. So, ESP tries to answer, ESP tries to justify these needs. Here is another picture which is very famous and uh, it has appeared in a very famous book. I would say uh, it, it is a classic book on 
legal uh, ESP English for specific purposes. And Hutchinson and Waters have uh, sketched the, this particular diagram, which is before you. So we can have English for social sciences, English for business. And so see, language has English language has like a tree and has been used in different conditions and contexts and situations for different purposes. So when we're talking about this, why ESP? The, why ESP is because the needs of every field are different. Let's take an example. We design the same syllabus for the students of engineering and the same syllabus for the students of arts. So communication skills there, communication skills here. English compulsory English for all. It is for BA, it is for BCom, it is for BSU, etc., etc. Now the needs of a commerce graduate are different from the needs of an arts graduate. And that's why we have to answer, we have to work in that direction where we can justify the needs of that particular field. And that is where English for specific purposes is there. And hence in this context, we have to concentrate on different data, different, uh, con uh, different texts that are to be included in the syllabus. I'll talk about this uh, later, but uh, let me mention two books right now. One is published by the Himalaya publications where uh, law and literature is mentioned. So very beautifully in this particular book, we find that various legal themes in different novels, dramas are there. And it has been done wonderfully well there in that particular book. Just an example, all of you know, uh, uh, Vijay Tendulkar's very famous drama, Silence the Court is in session. So this is a drama based on this legal theme. I'll take you out of the book and in the serial world, uh, we find that uh, Daya Nayak and so many others are there, CID is there. So these kind of serials are there. As far as uh, other novels are concerned, we find that many novels of Charles Dickens and even George Bernard Shaw, the dramas of George Bernard Shaw are based on legal themes. So that is another area. So it is the English in that particular uh, area, which, uh, which is to be prescribed for the students of law. But in many universities, the syllabus of even 12 plus students, English, studying law is general English. And uh, here is the need where we need to specify and we need to inculcate these things in a syllabi. So law and literature and law and language, because there is inseparable relationship between language and law, inseparable. Because however, whatever, whatsoever, you express for law through law is in English and that's why you have to use it very specifically very appropriately in this context ESP helps us and that's why why ESP it is ESP for this reason so Hutchinson has uh, rightly said all of his friends uh, that ESP is an approach to language teaching in which all decisions as to content and method are based on learners reason for learning so learners reason for learning. Why is the learner learning English? So uh, in our India, there is one context which has been discussed very widely, where we find that uh, there, there is a tree and uh, all the animals are asked to climb that particular tree. So the fish will climb, the birds will climb, the snake will climb, and even an elephant is asked to climb, or and a, a camel is asked to climb. So this is a very generalized kind of curriculum that we design. And as Hutchinson and others have said, we feel that uh, there should be a, a specific syllabus, a particular syllabus designed considering the needs of the learners. This is where English for specific purposes is. And the demarcation line is very, very thin because uh, general English is not very different from legal English because many things are common. We have the tenses and we have the parts of speech, everything is there, but some, uh, some words are different. You we may say that circumlocution is there or lexicon differs a little. The sentences are very, very long sometimes. We'll, we'll discuss that when we talk about legal syntax. However, as uh, 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 Hutchinson has rightly said, in theory, there is no difference, but in practical, a great deal of difference is there. So when we practice law, or when we try to practice this particular English, then we find that there is a greater difference. So there are three main characteristics of ESP, that is English for specific purposes, that it is designed to meet the specific needs of learners. Second, 
the methodology is different and depends upon the activities that are involved or undertaken or expected to be undertaken. And it is the language appropriate to these activities in terms of grammar, lexis, register, study skills, discourse, and journal. So these are the things that makes ESP, that is legal language, or any language, any English, different from other English sets. I'm using the word English sets. So I, I hope uh, what is ESP is clear now. To conclude about ESP, we find that English for specific purposes means the English designed or expected to be learned by the students of law is different. The students of arts different. The students of engineering different. And the English to be learned by the students of commerce and science is different because expected needs are there. Apart from this, the English used by the hotel managers, that is hotel management, used by nurses, that is hospital staff. Now we may add one more variety of English. English for specific purposes, the another variety is for COVID-19. So coronavirus is everywhere and uh, I'll share that particular vocabulary with you after some time, if, if we get time. Or if Professor Dr. Prashan Moti gives us time. So yes. COVID-19 vocabulary is different. The words which are used are different. So uh, we find that coronavirus was very not a very comfortable word for us. And then COVID-19 and then swab tests. So this is a different English altogether. It is English, but it is a different English and that is English for specific purposes. So when we try to educate people, enlighten people, awaken people regarding COVID-19, then we use those specific words that lexicon differs. But the basic structure remains the same. Sometimes the syntax changes. For example, the English of doctor or the writing of doctors is completely uh, unreadable for us, but the med medical practitioners, the chemists and drugists understand it. So that is what English for specific purposes is. So suppose we want to concentrate on the faculty of engineering, then their purposes are different, how the engineers, the mechanics and other staff need to interact with others, need to use that particular English. So we find that manuals are there and their English is different. So that is English for specific purposes. Now, let us enter legal language. So legal language is English for specific purposes. So some people have called it a second language. Some people call it a register. Some people call it a, call it a sub language. But forget what people say because it is a matter of research. Let's concentrate on legal language as English for specific purposes. So now on, let me explain what legal language is and what are the salient features of legal language and how the lexicon is, how the style is, how the syntax is, and how the lawyers communicate. And uh, of course, we'll talk about some demerits also, or the criticism against legal language. And uh, at the outset of legal language, let me tell you that uh, in Western world, there is a language movement. And this plain language movement uh, says, feels, expects that English should be so simple in legal discourse that should be understood by laypersons. Now, I interviewed some judges. Uh, I must mention Honorable Ganga Purwala Sahib of Aurangabad High Court. I also interviewed Honorable Sri Ushwal Nikam, sir. And all these people have different views regarding uh, legal language. I also interviewed Honorable Ganesh Devi, sir, in this regard. So the opinions are different. However, one conclusion is there that a particular language is expected and has a tradition, has that reputation and has to be maintained. Because a particular word is recognized, identified by a culture, by a particular discourse and tradition. And when we take it out of that context, then the meanings differ. We'll talk about how one word may have different meanings. For example, the word act, Act in legal language may be act this and that act. For example, the act of labor law, etc., etc. According to Act One, Act Three, and clause and article, such things are there. But when we talk about act in drama, then we have Shakespearean dramas divided into five acts. And then again, when we use it in a very general discourse, then act means your act is not good. That is deed, D W E D. Again, this deed in legal language is different. For example. It's a kind of contract or agreement, a, a kind of transaction between two parties. So that is a deed. But when we talk about karma, the deed, then that particular discourse is different, general discourse. So that is what legal language is. That is how English for specific purposes is. 
So what is legal language? It is the language used by the persons related to law field or legal profession. So they are lawyers, advocates, barristers, and um, even the clerks working in court or the judges, the jurists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or even when there is a communication or conversation, interaction between a client and lawyer on that particular matter, then the words like lawsuit or repetition or appeal and such words are used. So that is also legal language. So it is not something legal versus illegal. It is legal means the language of law. So it has nothing to be legal, that adjective that we perceive. Uh, it is a language or register. Again, we have discussed already. It is just a variety. Of course, the same words are used. Borrowing is there. So many plain words are used. These are some of the characteristics of legal language. So the legalese, we have already said that we should not use the word legalese because it is taken negatively. Jargon, yes, when we don't understand a particular word or words in a particular language, then jargon is there. And yes, legal language has so many jargons. And then, yeah, it is uh, English for specific purposes. And shall we use plain language? I will ask towards the end of my talk whether we should go for plain language. So legal English, this is what I found on Wikipedia. Whether we trust it or not, that is a different thing, but I got a wonderful variety here. That legal language is a kind of English which is used in legal writing. The natural language, which is which has difference in vocabulary, morphology, syntax, and semantics. I'll be talking about these uh, features very shortly. Again, the legal is, as I said just now, has been criticized. This is also from Wikipedia. Lay readers cannot read it or comprehend it. That's why it is legalese, etc., etc. Now, see, the language of law can be used in different contexts. In legal language, also, we find that different contexts are there. So there are some pedagogical uses. For example, the language used by law teachers in a, a college while delivering the talk, or the spoken discourse is there, or the written forms are there, forms, agreements, contracts, and deeds, and wills. So many written matters are there, or some uh, legis uh, legislature, legislative decisions are there, or some, uh, some, some laws are made, some reports are published. All these are legal languages. Of course, cases are there, acts are there, articles are there, clauses are there, judgments are there, forms are there. When we talk about academic use of legal language, then we find that textbooks are there and there are journals like Indian, uh, sorry, AIR is there, All India Reporter is there, or there is one journal called Manopatra Online Journal is there. So all these are academic writings. So uh, we find there are some wonderful books written by the judges. How Judges Think is a wonderful book. So that also amounts to be the language of law because the judges write in their legalistic style. So that, um, that uh, means that is also legal language. So it is conversation between the lawyer and client. It is discussion between two lawyers. It is the cross-examination in the court. It is the argument that a lawyer presents in the court. That is all legal language. So uh, it's driven by situation driven by topic and the necessity and all that. There is what legal language is. So uh, here we find that the three one is already we have seen in that picture. Then second is, of course, legislative. Laws are made. Uh, I, I hope you all know the pillars of our nation and uh, three pillars, etc., etc. And then, of course, uh, we have judicial text. It is not juridical. It is a typo error. Sorry for that. So distinct features. What are the features of legal language? So there are common words with uncommon meaning. Just now we talked about uh, some words like D W E D deed. We talked about act. And there are so many words. Even the word shall has different meaning in legal language. So uh, when we find shall in general English, it is the model auxiliary or a, a primary auxiliary used in future tense, especially after first person, singular and plural. So I shall and we shall, that's it. We usually don't say he shall. And when he shall is used, it becomes a legal language. Why? Because it is, it is law abiding. A person has to follow, a person has to adhere to law. So in our prospectus of our college or a manual or a brochure, we, we, we mention that all the participants shall carry the identity card. So shall, shall is a special use. 
so common words are there but there is an uncommon meaning so the words like will so will is a helping verb for us or will finds the way that is another will wish desire passion etc but when we talk about legal language that is different will you i hope death will and all mrutyu patra and all you know very well so uh, again when we talk about legal language we find that there are many words from old english and middle english so you find that uh, english, uh, legal language is antique it is beautiful also because many antique pieces are kept in our households also in our, at our in our homes also so that makes the legal language beautiful also at the same time and then there are so many latin words so latin is a very popular language very famous very rich and when we use such words from such a language classical language then definitely our discourse our interaction becomes very standard and then we find that uh, there is special or very very particular legal vocabulary there is another feature very formal words are used passive voice is used because we don't know who the person is there or there are more persons so everything has to be taken into consideration and that's why we find that it's very formal it need not be informal at all there is no reason for legal language to be informal and then there are words with flexible meanings it depends upon that particular context how the word can be interpreted and that's why it's completely different and sometimes there is extreme precision on one hand and then you find that there is prolixity and circumlocution I'll I'll be citing some examples of this also. There is one book, very wonderful book, edited by Mr. Bhatnagar. The title of the book is Law and Language, and we find that uh, in one of the lessons, the language of the law, one retired judge of America has beautifully written an article in which he has given some examples about circumlocution, polyxity, that when lawyers need to say a very simple thing, they extract the Uh, just uh, drag it and extend the meaning postpone the meaning and uh, that that uh, sometimes harms the repetition of legal language all inclusiveness means everything has to be covered in uh, the language the law and that's why sometimes you have to include so many things so when you read an act you find that uh, that english is different because everything is defined so all the persons suppose the act begins like this all the persons and again the word persons is redefined or explained persons means who exactly so this is how the legal language has circumlocution so there are beautiful examples and one example i would like to cite that uh, long back 4 500 years ago in king Re- king henry 8th regime when the acts of parliament were written one single sentence i am i am emphasizing this and stressing this one single sentence had 492 words in one single sentence can you imagine how long the sentence is 492 words now it was not exceptional that only one sentence was there because there were many other sentences with nearly 460 480 words so if this kind of english is there then it's very difficult to digest to comprehend so these are some of the shortcomings or the merits of legal language though people or the law experts say that it is necessary for them to do so so when we talk about the distinctive features uh, common words with uncommon meaning for example lawsuit and action these words are there old english aforesaid or henceforth or hereby Uh, to whom so ever kind of word all these are very very frequently used words or herein here with uh, such words are used and the latin words are there we'll talk about them a little while and uh, specialized legal vocabulary inferior court when we say inferior court it does not mean that the court is inferior as such but there are hierarchies of courts so in that case it is inferior court and uh, some uh, formal words the truth you can read on the screen i did not read it for you and then some open textured uh, words are used these are some of the distinctive features there are ma- many more features that will uh, discuss of course so this is very interesting you find uh, it is at us at a time repetition but at the same time there is more clarity so why answerable and accountable uh, it is said that accountable and answerable are synonyms 
but when we talk about synonyms also they are like human beings that even two half brothers or the twins or the test tube babies are not similar they are, they differ in many ways so no two words are never same no two words are same. never they have their own meaning they have their own facets of meaning colors of meaning shades of meaning and that's why answerable is slightly different from accountable and that's why sometimes in legal language we find that both these words are used at a time they are called legal doublets so answerable and accountable sometimes responsible word is also used or appropriate appropriate and proper many times we use the, the these two words are synonyms so how we wonder how these two words are used together in advertisements etc etc we find such doublets a lot terms and conditions so sometimes terms and conditions are same but terms are different and conditions are different so this is how uh, we uh, for example in our research we say that aim and objectives or aims and objectives so there is slight difference between the aims and objectives though they are synonymous so i have said that no two words are same attach and annex for us same attachment or annexure almost same almost same but not same and that's why in order to include everything that is all inclusiveness nothing should be left because here again law experts will be there and if somebody says that these are the terms then the person legal expert will say these are not conditions these are just terms like this and that's why terms and conditions nothing should be left rules and regulations doublet legal doublets are there so bills and notes you, everybody knows what is the difference between bills and notes so we we were shocked when synonyms were used in the same phrase as doublet then there are some triplets also that i have so many examples if anybody is interested but our time will not permit us so triplets are there form manner and method three different things are there you can read other things there are many things that i want to share that's why i am just going a little faster so foreign words and expressions are there especially derived and borrowed from french and latin so we say that english is a borrowed language now when we talk about legal language it is too much borrowed so the words like court appeal judge they are from french and latin origins ex parte very commonly used in legal discourse or even in the political discourse now it is in the parliament or legislature we find such words are uh, used very exclusively used actually jurisdiction is used for police jurisdiction police station jurisdiction uh, we have already we already use per capita in uh, financial finance sector so motto is very widely used statute ex officio used for different uh, bos members principals etc etc we have seen that <laughs> now uh, again we find that the parliament is adjourned like this so sign the and so many other words are used ad hoc so many teachers have been appointed ad hoc so it's a latin word and it, it has its own meaning so such expressions are alias you can see we use uh, we also use it or terrorists have their different names or pseudonym names or uh, different names so we find that good day alias like this, like this has been used sub judice so matter is sub judice we, we should not comment on a particular matter because it is sub judice uh, alimony is used uh, we call it uh, county or the allowance a husband is supposed to give to his wife when they don't live together or they don't want to live together so these are some of the words bona fide we give bona fide certificate to our students but see how its meaning is different in legal context but such words have become very common in english and that's why it is no more a strange thing for us there are some legal maxims uh, we use it use it very very often and very uh, generally that is king can do no wrong actually this is from uh, this foreign borrowing rex non protest uh, back here and there is another one i have cited it in the beginning of my talk today ignorantia facit excuse i i may be mispronouncing it i'm sorry for that so ignorance of law is no excuse and this is another one so we find that there are some words 
uh, we have already talked about this. Uh, they have different meaning altogether. So execute, execution, you know well that the Delhi rapists were executed. So execution of there, or then some project is there, then project is executed, that is different. So party, chiller party is different, rave party is different, and in legal context, that party is completely different. The most interesting word uh, in law and outside law is bar. So BR bar is a rod, iron rod. BR bar is beer bar, permit room, beer bar and all. Bar is also a verb where we prohibit somebody. And in bar, it is the advocates bar. That is Vakil Sangh, the association or the professional group of lawyers, etc. So right has many meanings, um, right hand, left hand, and right, uh, right and wrong. And here it is right means hak. Uh, so different meaning altogether. So duty again is different. We have fundamental rights, we have fundamental duties. So here wrong is not right and wrong. The wrongdoing is there. So something which is illegal. So many words are there. When we talk about legal syntax, then there is an example before you. It is just one single sentence. So many clauses, compound, multiple sentences there, complex sentences are there. So many clauses are there, too much of foregrounding is there and embedding of clauses is there. And that's why we find that legal language is basically very long. Very few simple sentences are used. We find that passive voice is used. There is a reason behind that because we don't know who the uh, doer of action is. So the subject is not specified and that's why we find that it is passive voice that has been exclusively used. So the Acronym used shall be used. Who shall used? We don't know. That's why passive voice is used. There is a detached or impersonal style because uh, now we find that they are enacted by the parliaments, etc. So no one may be subjected to slavery, servitude, or forced labor. See, you find that impersonal and detached, very, very formal, uh, sometimes very cold kind of style is the or style of legal language. Another example is before you and uh, uh, verbosity, another feature. I hope uh, it, it is a stylistic feature of verbosity. When uh, we say that <clears throat> brevity is the soul of wit, when we can, uh, everything, we can say everything in a minimum words, minimum number of words. Why is it necessary to use many words? But uh, legal language has that tradition we find that uh, in legal language, we see give consideration to. So your honor, I expect you to give consideration to. This is how the lawyers interact. This is how the lawyers argue or present their case in the court. So instead of saying give consideration to, you can see the right word, simple word would be consider. So give goods to, simple meaning is delivery. So on your right is simple English, general English, plain English, comprehensible, understandable English. And on your left is verbose expression, which is the salient feature of legal language. There are so many examples like this. Then legalistic expression, you can see on your left, advocate number of, and in our ordinary expression, we see enough. So of course there is difference between sufficient, enough and adequate. But again, communication is uh, what is important more than our impression. We, we need, we, we should, communicate to express ourselves, not to impress ourselves. But traditions are there. So legal tradition is there or legalistic tradition is there. So you can see on your right, left and right how legalistic and ordinary expressions are. So of course, uh, we find that um, sometimes richness is necessary. Paradigm is becomes richer because it is a foreign word. And per day is very ordinary, very simple. So it also depends upon the context. To, to, to have rhetoric and uh, eloqu eloquence or that oratory. Of course, we need some very standard, very rich words. And so this is the example of that. So we find that uh, if he is used or unless he is used, and we have been studying this unless and if, use unless and remove if, etc. from our childhood. But here we find that another word is used that is provided. So this provided has nothing to do with provision and all that. Provided is simply if. So uh, Dr. Mote will say that uh, all the participants will be given the certificate of participation in the webinar 
provided they annex the screenshot of their participation and submit the Google form. So provided, provided means if, but in legal language, it appears to be a little richer. So uh, after this discussion, where we found that uh, the words that is lexicon is different, the vocabulary, legal vocabulary is different, and um, the legal style is different, that is legal uh, uh, syntax is different. And of course, it amounts to the legal semantics also, where the meaning differs. So everybody shall, shall makes it compulsory. So that is how the meaning is derived. A lay person who has trivial knowledge of English may say that everyone shall is wrong, everyone will should be used. So this is how uh, in semantics also we find that meaning. There is one example how uh, legal language can be uh, is used, has been used and how briefly we can say. For example, when a person has to say no, the legal uh, person or the person involved in legal discourse says that the answer to this question is negative or no. So instead of saying simply no, the person legal expert says, or the user of a legal language says, the answer to this question is negative. So uh, what we see about legal language and how it is English for specific purpose is that it is a distinct variety because of the lexicon, the French Latin originated words, borrowed words from Latin and French are there. There are legal maxims also, which are very common, commonly used. So many antique words and phrases are there. Uh, we have already seen there are many phrases like in accordance with uh, as far as and so as to and such as and said such words are also used and uh, it has its own characteristics it differs from the ordinary english because of the words because of the treatment of the words the meaning of words the context the syntax very very long sentences and intricate intricacy circumlocution prolixity, et cetera, et cetera. This law or law reports or the judgments or the writ petitions, we find that legal language is there and it is English for specific purposes. There is some criticism against the legal language, which I said in the beginning of my talk, David Malinkoff is a, and a, who is an authority says that legal language is wordy, pompous and dull. We the students and uh, teachers of literature of course, find legal language very, very boring because of lengthiness, intricacy, circumlocution, and needless, needless dragging and postman, postponement of the meaning. Will Rogers also says that the minute you read something you can't understand, you can be almost sure it was drawn by a lawyer. And there is lots of criticism about the writings of lawyer because uh, lawyers, when they speak, they speak very well. When Urban Levy also says the same thing. When they write, their writing is not good. So this is the criticism against legal language. And John Lindsay also say the same thing. Law books are the largest body of poorly written literature ever created by human race. So this is this is the criticism against the legal writing. And a few more things are there: swaddled in obscurity, and even Jeremy Bentham has says characterized by redundancy of language and unnecessary intricacies. I already said that so many things are very unnecessary. But legal experts say that it is for all inclusiveness, etc., etc. And yeah, you can read the criticism. We are running a lot of time. That's why I'll just make you read it. So thank you very much. I think uh, time is up. If uh, I have a little more time, I can explain a few more things. Prashant, sir? Yes, yes, sir. There are a few questions in Q&A. OK, sir. Okay. One by one, I will ask you. Please, sir. OK, there is one uh, first question by Shampa Chakravarti, ma'am. OK. Is the syntax of legal language different too? Uh, yes, madam, because I spoke about a sentence in uh, the acts of parliament in the regime in the reign of uh, henry VIII, wherein we find that in one single sentence there are 492 words so this is the different syntax actually i have said in the beginning itself 
that when we talk about the tenses, the parts of speech, and the overall SVO, etc., SVOC structure, the seven grades structure, it is the same. But the difference in syntax is that it's very long, very intricate, very complex. Too much of embedding, too much of foregrounding is there. And when you just uh, go through that sentence, wherein there are 492 words, just imagine how long the sentence is. So this is where the syntax of legal language differs. Again, when we talk about act, I have given an example there where we find that suppose <clears throat> the act begins, all the persons, just suppose. I can give examples also. So there we find that uh, person, the word persons is defined again. So there is no need to define, but to make the meaning clear and absolutely clear, not just clear, absolutely, so that there is no other meaning. Such a kind of definition, such kind of extension, such kind of explanation and description of the words is there. And that's why the legal syntax slightly differs, though the line is very thin of demarcation, but there is difference. Another question. Please, yes, please list out some of the famous works written by using legal language. Uh, see. I, I have in my talk itself, I have talked about some retired uh, judges, for example, Honorable um, Ayer sir or uh, Ram Jetmalani sir and their writings, how judges think, etc. Or uh, the, the judges who executed the killers of the uh, uh, killers of Indira Gandhi, etc. They have written beautiful judgments or th those who have been uh, uh, hanged, you know, even those judges, how they thought that time they have been written. So Justice Krishna Iyer is an example, Ram Jetmalani sir is another example. And I have in the beginning given two more examples. How legal in literature also there is legal language. For example, when we refer to the merchant of Venice, or when we refer to silence the court is in session, or when we refer to some dramas of um, uh, G.B. Shaw, like Apple Cart even, though there is much literature and less law, but it is based on law. The merchant of Venice in particular, we find that bond is there, the contract is there, and so many other things are there. How the bond is executed towards the end, and how one drop of blood changes everything, etc., etc. So, so these are some of the works. And when we talk about legal language, uh, if you, if Madam is or Sir is talking about the works which are based on legal language, then in India, except uh, Mr. Bhatia, there is no authority who has talked. In uh, abroad, we find uh, Urban Library is there, Melinkomf is there, and uh, there is, uh, of course, Bentham is there, and so many other writers are there. Okay, sir. Uh, what are the, sorry, what are modern approaches to teaching ESP? As far as uh, modern approaches are, are concerned, uh, Miss, uh, we find that Plain if we talk about e legal language as ESP, then there is in uh, th there is inclusion of plain language. Whether plain language should be accepted and uh, sh should be adopted in schools and colleges and universities, that is one of the aspects in legal language. And then again, we find that ESP has widened its sphere. So earlier we were talking about the academic academic writing or the English for medical or English for engineering faculties or uh, disciplines, but now it has got wider space for, uh, for example, English for medical representatives, English for nurses, or English for hotel waiters even. So this is how we find that it has wide, widened its sphere. Sir, there is a, another question hmm? by Dr. Ashok Kadam, sir. Hmm? Sir, don't you think that our courts are still not out of imperial colonial influence from linguistic uh, point of view, is current English insufficient to function without Latin, Greek, Greek French uh, originated dif uh, difficult words? Why legal English is not made simple? This is, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. And uh, I have said that there are two streams one that they want to retain this legal language because there is too much of importance given to precedent so what has been said earlier that that is very substantial very significant and that's why if you want to change something for example when the word like jury is there which is now not used 
in Indian context in particular. But there is tradition, there is a culture, legal culture is there. And the words have that meaning which springs from that particular culture or tradition. And that's why there is plain language movement also. But when you use this plain language, you won't enjoy it because legal language has its own merits. Legal language has its own status and reputation. So that antique kind of thing, and I said while giving the examples from Latin, that it makes the legal language very rich. And when we talk about rhetoric and eloquence and all that, we find that such rich words are necessary. During my interview with Honorable Ujwal, uh, Kadam, sir, Ujwal Nikam sir yes. and Honorable uh, Gangapur Wala Sahib and even Devi sir, all these people say that, let legal language be like that. You try to upgrade and update yourselves. So uh, if uh, one, one of the persons, um, I, I, I wouldn't like to disclose the name, said that if uh, lay persons, if the common people try to understand the law, then how will the lawyers maintain their livelihood live? <laughs> so it is the question of their livelihood also. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Wait, wait a minute, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, there is a, one more question. Do you find Indianized legal words in court at the time of judgment? Correct. A very good question uh, be because see number one English is a borrowed language and legal language is more borrowed language and when we talk about Indian English it is again thrice, thrice uh, borrowed language. We borrowed English uh, th there is influence of British law etc on Indian English and when we interpret these things in our court we find that the things like Kacheri, Mamledar, Belief all these words are not found in any other language. So 400 years rule, Mughal rule is responsible partly for this. And then again, the necessities of that particular community of that culture, because we have Zata Panchayat also, that community codes are there. So from there, because laws spring from so many sources, from so, so many requirements and necessities. So when they uh, arise or when they spring from the necessities of customs, traditions, etc., then they are retained there. And that's why such Indianized lexicon is also there. And I have already cited some words like uh, Mabledar, etc., etc., Belid, or even Tasildar. Tasildar is not an English word at all. So such words are still there. Yes. I think. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, Dr. Vaibho Sabni, sir, for your fruitful, delightful, comprehensive, highly informative, and insightful session. With your lucid uh, language and melodious voice, you have clearly explained what is ESP, characteristics of ESP, legal language, features of legal language, lexical, le legal uh, lexicon, the use of foreign expressions and words. Uh, further, at the end of your talk, you have clearly elaborated about borrowed legal magazines. So, uh, 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 you have clearly mentioned about legal language as English for specific purposes. In fact, we thoroughly enjoyed and learned a lot about uh, by your talk. And uh, thank you very much one and all for your active participation by logging Zoom app and those who are watching on YouTube channel and made this lecture series grand grand uh, success. Let's join together at 1 p.m. for another interesting session by a great academician and policy maker, uh, director of IAC, Dr. Ashok Thorat, sir. Uh, Dr. Thorat, sir, will speak on need to incorporate pragmatics and digital humanities in the curriculum of state unities, universities. Uh, let's share and grow together. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Dr. Thank Vibos you for Samish, giving me the opportunity. I thank all the also. participants also. Yes. And they can ask me questions via my email or mobile number, which is available uh, with uh, Mote sir and my, on my first slide also it was there. Thank you very much. This was a really a great pleasure for me to be here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm my ending pleasure. the meeting. Thank you.